But if you've just joined us, welcome to Gem A Live. I'm Julia Griffith, and today we're going to be talking about composite gemstones, which are gemstones that are artificially uh, composed and put together by man to imitate one piece. So just to talk about some of the things that we're going to be learning this session, uh, we're going to be talking about what composites actually are. So discussing uh, how they're created and put together and why people do this. So why are these products on the market? We're also then going to look at some key observation features for some of the more common composites, because there are many composites out there. We're just going to focus on some of the more common uh, types and just talk about some of their key features. And I've got lots of photographs to show you about that. And then at the end, we're also going to view some more examples of composites just to blow your mind a bit to what is actually available on the market, because it always blows my mind. So to start off, what is a composite gem? So it is a gem that's been artificially constructed uh, to look like one gemstone. And this is made up of two or more component parts. I've got a variety of kind of constructions that are possible on the screen for you here. Uh, some of them can be called uh, doublets. Doublets is when they're made out of two parts uh, with one part being on top of the other. And this can be for a number of reasons using a number of different materials. Another common term for composites would be triplets. And triplets are those that are made out of three components, so three separate pieces that are somehow stuck or fused together. And again, one on top of the other. But we do have some other types of composites on the market. These are those that are just made up of lots of pieces of gemstones all stuck together. I've got a couple of photographs as examples towards the end, but one example, just to give you one now, might be uh, composite amber. So amber, if you have lots of little chips, they might heat this up and push this together to create one piece. So that's a composite amber. Or you might have amber in resin. So lots of little amber chips floating around, well, not floating, but um, solidified into a piece of resin to again look like one piece. But actually, it's a composite made up of lots of little individual parts. So if we now talk about why they are made, well, actually, it's a variety of reasons. And we'll talk about them depending on which composite we're talking about or focusing on. But some of the more common reasons, uh, firstly, uh, quite often, it's for imitation. So they are simulating something that's of a higher worth or of a higher value or that has nicer properties. That's often what they're um, created to do. So have a cheaper version of something on the market, a lookalike, so to speak. For a number of gems, actually, composites have to be made uh, to improve the gemstone's durability. So I've got a few examples at the end where some gemstones must be made into doublets or capped with something that's of a uh, higher uh, durability so that it can be worn as a gemstone in the first place. And then uh, also another one is to increase the size or weight of the gem again so it can be set and worn as a piece of jewellery. On some occasions they're actually uh, put together to improve optical phenomena or to create some new effects within the gemstone. And then sometimes there is a uh, they're put together to utilize gems that are too small or too thin to be made into jewellery otherwise. They're your opal composites which we're going to focus on a bit later. It produces a range of alternative products for the market, often at lower price points. So therefore, you have a wider audience for gemstones. And sometimes they can actually be put together for an artistic reason to actually create something brand new that actually is very aesthetically pleasing. And right at the end, I've got some photographs of that uh, just to show you what can be done um, with a bit of creative flair. So the common composites that we're going to be talking about today, that we're going to focus on five of them. Uh, we're going to focus on opal doublets and opal triplets. That's our first two. These are probably the most common composites on the market. So uh, very, very common because the components that we're using, these slivers of opal, are very common. The next one. Um, one, which will be our third gemstone, is pseudo stones. So pseudo stones are stones that are stuck together. Uh, we'll talk about those and focus on those in a bit. Uh, corundum doublets 
And then lastly, we're going to look into garnet topped doublet. So all of these different gemstones, uh, it depends. The earliest ones really are your GTDs coming around in the 1850s. Uh, and then your corundum doublets, early 1900s, opal doublets and triplets, early 1900s. So actually, they've been around for quite a long time. And so we do find them, especially in antique pieces of jewellery. Um, so, yes, from more commonly nowadays, actually, where synthetics are so prevalent, they're not being made as often. But there's an awful lot on the market. So we're going to look into each one in turn, talk about their common features and have a look at some photographs of those common features so that you know what to look out for uh, when you're checking out these composites in the market. So we're going to start off with opal composites. Uh, when it comes to opal, this is formed most commonly within seams within sedimentary rocks. And here is a photograph showing this seam that's been split into two. And this is actually known as a split. And what can happen when it's on this lovely ironstone matrix is we will actually fashion gemstones, including the matrix, to get them to be sizable enough and strong enough so that we can have this lovely bolder opal jewellery. But what happens when we split a piece of opal in this fashion is that lots of slithers or thinner chunks of opal can also fall off. And what do we do with those slithers of opal? We could use them in jewellery, which is what we're going to do with composites. Uh, without that, really, they can't be used in jewellery. We'd have to, you know, just throw them into the tailings. That would be a shame. So that's what we're using up. Apart from the splits that you just saw within the ironstone matrix, uh, also an awful lot of opal grows in other rocks, for example, rhyolite and sandstone, um, claystone and other rocks that just aren't durable enough to actually be fashioned into a gemstone. So you end up with these small fragments, like in this picture here, uh, you might not be able to cut a sizable cabochon out of it. So therefore, we actually are going to make opal composites out of them instead. And the two opal composites that we have on the market are opal doublets and opal triplets. Let's have a look at how they're made a um, bit closer. So opal doublets, this is using a thin slice of opal at the top. And then we back this quite commonly with ironstone matrix. And when we have the ironstone matrix on the back, it can look very similar to a bolder opal, especially if the gem's set. Also, quite commonly, we can just have a plastic backing. But in either or, uh, often the adhesive that's used in between the junction plane between the opal and the backing is black. So that actually you're giving the opal this dark background, which enhances the play of color that you see within the opal. When it comes to opal triplets, these are made slightly differently. Uh, one of the key differences is um, really the fact it's got three layers, but it's also the opal that we're using. Often this is used, um, often just really thin layers of opal are used to make opal triplets. So just a slither of opal. And then behind this, we have a black backing. Originally, this was onyx, uh, but quite often now it's just plastic. And then on top, we have a colorless cabochon, uh, which again is often nowadays plastic, but it used to be quartz quite commonly. So you have these three layers. The black background is there again to help enhance that play of color that you see in the opal because it contrasts with that black backing. And then your colorless cabochon top, that's there because the thin layer of opal is actually really susceptible to damage. So it's there for protection and also offers a bit more enhancement as well to that play of color. So pr protection and enhancement, that's your opal triplet. Now, the opal that's used quite commonly, it will be precious opal, so natural precious opal. But I have seen some that are synthetic opal in the middle. And so that's something that you might have to look out for as well. So you can get synthetic opal doublets and triplets. And also I've seen, I've got a picture of it a bit later, uh, pieces of tiny fragments of opal. So really tiny, uh, just making up almost a mosaic opal triplet which is what I've got, actually. I got it in my Gem A set when I was a student, so I've got a photograph of that a bit later. But let's just focus on opal doublets first of all. Opal doublets from the face-up position actually give no indication at all that they're a gem that's been put together artificially. But from the side, 
we can actually see this very straight junction plane. And this is the main identifying feature for an opal doublet, this very consistent straight plane. If we have a little bit little look closer at this plane, you may also see this layer of dark adhesive. So that's offering a dark background for that opal, as well as showing you exactly where they've been stuck together. If we compare this to a natural boulder opal, so just like that very first picture that I showed you of that opal split, and it's just been fashioned into a cabochon including the backing it will actually look like this so very similar however if you focus on that side boundary between the opal and the ironstone backing which is naturally joined together uh, you actually see that it's got an uneven appearance to it so it's not straight like the ones that we put together ourselves but it has this very wibbly wobbly boundary where they're joined together Another thing that you might see in opal doublets is an abrupt change in opal seam direction. Let me just show you. So here, quite obvious, this is not a natural stone completely. Uh, you actually have that thin layer of opal at the top and then your black junction there in the middle. And then you've got a completely random direction of opal going through your ironstone matrix. So these are really hard to actually identify when they're set, especially if they've got that bolder um, opal beg your pardon, especially if they've got that ironstone backing, because when they're set in a bezel setting, so when the metal goes all the way around the gem, there's no indication, there's no way that you're going to know that actually it's a doublet. Even if you look at the back and it's ironstone, it could still be a boulder opal, a natural boulder opal. So really the way that you tell is uh, if it's set, it will be to do with disclosure from the person that's uh, selling it to you and also for the price. So if they're just a few hundred dollars for a black opal, well, that's a bargain. There's something going on there. So they're your indications really. So let's just do a summary of our opal doublets. Here's another opal doublet here. So it is a slice of opal um, and an on top of an ironstone uh, backing or sometimes just a plastic backing. And identification is all about that straight junction plane and seeing that adhesive glue. So uh, without seeing that, you'll have to base yourself on circumstantial evidence, so the price or that disclosure. When it comes to our opal triplets, so opal triplets, as I mentioned, just use slithers of opal, and these are really easy to identify. So we don't have to worry about opal triplets at all for identification. I'll show you all those pictures later. But when it comes to actually how they are constructed, this is actually a picture before construction. I took this photograph when I was in Australia at an opal place called Lightning Bridge Opal Company in Melbourne. If you're ever there, go. They are fantastic at teaching you all about opals. And actually, you can see here that you've actually just got colourless um, plastic at the back. And then they've used just that black adhesive to adhere the opal onto. And that was the thinnest layer of opal. I couldn't stress how thin that layer is. So much less than a millimeter. So you've got your black backing, your very thin layer of opal, and this will be your cabochon, which they'll pop on top and then fashion the material from it. So what you end up having is this uh, three layered gemstone at the back is your plastic. And then you have your thin layer of opal, much less than a millimeter in thickness. And then on top, you have this transparent colorless cabochon. So to identify these from the side, you don't have to worry, just use your eyes. It's very obvious that it's not one solid piece of opal. It's got this very distinct layer of three separate components. When they're set, they're also very easily seen because often even when they're set uh, in a bezel setting, the cabochon dome will raise above it. So you can actually have a look at the stone from the side and see that that play of color isn't from the top and that actually that cabochon is transparent. Even from the top view, what you will see is the play of color is not on the surface and it doesn't react to the light around it. It actually, the play of color is very deep within the stone. And that's another indication that you're actually dealing with an opal triplet. And then because you have this colorless cabochon on top which has been glued onto the layer of opal you do then have some 
features that are inside that glue that has been that is holding the two materials together. And whenever you have something glued together or any junction, it does risk getting air bubbles or gas bubbles trapped inside. So in this photograph, and this is my um, mosaic opal I mentioned earlier, in this photograph you can see lots of little gas bubbles which are all trapped in that glue. And we can just see that from looking into the gem with magnification. Uh, you will never find gas bubbles in normal opal. And you'll never find this mosaic effect in natural opal either. So that's your identification for your opal triplet. So in summary, triplets are made out of just a slither of opal, could be natural, could be synthetic, could be a mixture of pieces, uh, your black backing, and then your colourless cabochon top. So here's another picture of those three layers. And your observation will be that colourless cabochon, you'll see it even when it's set. The play of colour deep within the stone, not on the surface like it should be for precious uh, solid opal. Gas bubbles within that junction plane. And then also these three layers of composites uh, or components, sorry, visible from the side. So really, really easy to spot. Now, I've actually just got this video for you. This is actually uh, from the Opal Ridge Company. Um, beg your pardon, Lightning Ridge Opal Company in Melbourne, uh, who uh, you're going to see you're going to hear speaking a lovely man called Jonas, uh, who taught me all about opals when I was there in Australia. If you're ever in Melbourne, go and visit him. He's absolutely fantastic. And what you're actually going to see here is um, a display of why they use black backing on opal. So the opal that they're going to use is actually this uh, they call it crystal opal because it doesn't actually have a body color. It's quite transparent or translucent. And you'll actually see how well that black backing will enhance that play of color. Fortunately, the sound doesn't seem to be working, but we'll give it a go. Now, obviously on a light background, doesn't show much color. <laughs> Pretty cool, eh? It's a difference, yeah. Can you take it off? Yeah. Let's see that again. Oh, that blows my mind. Let's watch it again. Here we go. Now, obviously on a light background, doesn't show much colour. <laughs> Pretty cool, eh? Yeah. Can you take it off? Yeah. So there we have it. That's just showing you the before opal that they use. So just white opal or crystal opal and how amazing it looks just with that black backing. It absolutely amazed me actually how effective uh, just backing it with black uh, is. It's just absolutely amazing. So really making it look like black opal when actually it's, it's not. So awesome. So that's our opal composites. Uh, now we're going to move on to our third gemstone. We're on to our third composite gem already. And we're going to talk about Soudé gemstones. Now Soudé is French for solder. And what this composite is made out of, it's very unique, so nothing else is like a Soudé. It's actually made from a colourless crown, a colourless pavilion, and then coloured glue which is going to be where the join is. So we call that join the junction plane. So that bit in the center here. So uh, the different materials that it's made out of, well, actually there's a number of materials that Sude stones are typically made out of. Uh, these are anything that is colorless, cheap, and relatively inclusion free. So typical materials include synthetic colorless spinel. This makes excellent Sude stones, uh, colorless quartz, this could be natural, because natural colourless quartz is very common, or it could be synthetic to get it extra inclusion free. Colourless beryl, so goshenite, uh, this can be either synthetic or natural again. Natural is quite expensive still, so it'll probably be a synthetic colourless beryl. And then also colourless sapphire. Again, probably synthetic, but it could be natural. And all of these materials are typically used to make up a Sude stone. So really you're testing for refractive index and things. It really depends on what it's made out of. But really the price will still be very cheap because it is an artificial manufactured product. So when it comes to Sude stones, these can occur in any color that glue can come in because it's the glue that's giving them a color 
not the material itself. And often they're just called what they're imitating. So these are pure, purely created for imitation. Uh, so here, if it's red glue, it will be a Sude Ruby, most likely. In the center here with green glue, they're often called Sude Emeralds. And then our blue glue at the end here will be a Sude Sapphire. And typically to make them even more convincing, they will be made out of the material that they are imitating. So what I mean by that is for our sapphire sude that we have here, our sude sapphire, they'll probably use colorless synthetic sapphire to make that so that when we test that crown, it will test as a sapphire. But don't worry because the other tests and your observations will reveal that actually it's not all that it seems. So let's have a look a bit more at some sude gemstones. Oh, so this is actually the main photograph I used for this lecture because I found it so fascinating. These are all Sude gemstones. So here we've got a Sude Pariba in the middle, Pariba Tourmaline. You've got a Sude Ametrine. Hmm? Who knew? Sude Amethyst, Sude Tanzanite at the front, Sude Peridot, a Sude Morgan, I can't even speak anymore, Sude Morganite over here. And basically any colour that glue can be made in, you can make a Sude. And these are all Sudes. Uh, I've never seen these Sudes really commonly in the trade. These are all Gemme stones that I came across one day and I was amazed. Just to prove that they are Sude stones, here they are from the back. So uh, you can see, particularly in the larger stones, that actually those pavilions do not contain colour at all. And that's because the only thing causing colour in these gemstones is that one single plane of coloured glue. And because gems are very shiny and reflective, it will actually reflect that colour all the way around the stone. So from the face up position, you wouldn't even guess, not without magnification. Now, this colourless pavilion that I'm showing you here is actually much harder to see in gems that are smaller, also in gems that have lots of facets. I find that often you can see this even just by having a look at the stones from this angle, from the back kind of side pavilion angle. Uh, you can see this very easily often on step cut stones. So this is always something that you can look out for. But also I'll show you some other tricks to have a look for these colourless components uh, in a couple of slides time. So let's have a look then at the identification of this stone. Now the crown and pavilion are often inclusion free, so often with a lot of composites we can see features within the different component parts. For these really there's not going to be anything that lets us know that this is a pseudo stone apart from trying to see the fact that it's colourless, which I'll show you later. Uh, for this composite stone and for a lot of other composite stones as well, the main features are going to be within the junction plane, so that area that they're joined together. Because of the fact that it has been joined together, you get potentially those trapped air bubbles and then also depending on how it's joined together, if it's glued for example, glue can dry out and glue can look a bit mottled uh, due to drying out as well. So therefore we can get some features, identifying features at the junction plane. And also we might be able to see, we will be able to see exactly where it joins together as well. So these are where our features are going to be, mainly in the junction plane for this stone. So let's have a look at some photographs. So here is the junction plane, as I mentioned before. Uh, often in Sudes, ironically, even though the colour's in the girdle, often when you look at the girdle of a Sude stone, it appears colourless. And then the crown and pavilion, which you can see here, so at top here's the crown, here's the pavilion down here, they still look green. But it's actually just due to the fact that that girdle is parallel to where we're looking, there's no colour reflecting in there. So often that colourless girdle is a real clue for your Sude stones. Then right in the middle of that girdle, if you follow this line across, you can see that actually there is a join there. And you can just about see, or under a microscope, you'll certainly be able to see the fact that it's got this colored single plane of glue in there. So that is your junction plane, and that is one of your identifying features. In some Sude stones, I've actually found that there's excess glue, so glue pouring out the sides almost. That is another very, uh, very key uh, observation that actually there's some glue attaching this stone together. But to see this colourless girdle, 
Uh, I've actually got a really nifty trick for seeing this in almost every Sude. This is my favorite way of identifying the, these stones. If I'm ever uh, suspecting that I might have a Sude, I'll actually shine a light straight through that girdle. So with a pen torch behind the stone going straight through the girdle, you can actually light that up and you will see very easily, like in this picture, that actually that girdle is colorless. And that is your proof that you're dealing with a Sude stone. Okay. So that's really good to remember, great way of quickly identifying them. Other things that you will see uh, within that junction plane, I mentioned to you earlier, so anything that can get stuck into the glue or that the glue can look like. So as well as excess glue, as I mentioned, you might have lots of little gas bubbles all squashed up and all in focus at the same time because they're in one single plane. You might have all of these gas bubble, um, trapped gas bubbles that you'll be able to see and if I turn the stone to the side you will then see that there's no gas bubbles in the crown no gas bubbles in the pavilion they're all just within that single plane letting you know that that's actually where they're stuck together also in this picture here you can actually see this mottled patchy glue uh, where it's colored as well you often get kind of these um, concentrations and different patchiness to the color as well so you can see that really well into this facet here just where so there's some more glue in some places and less glue in others actually makes it look this mottled patchy color uh, one time I was dealing with a corundum uh, thank you pardon Yes, a Sude Ruby that was made from Corundum, so tested as Ruby. Um, and this was actually my key feature. When I looked in, I said, oh, something's wrong. I see all this mottled patchiness. Then use the light through the girdle. And hey, I got myself an identification. Another thing, another test that you can do uh, to prove that actually what you're dealing with is a material made up of two separate component parts that are colorless is you can immerse it in a liquid. These photographs, I actually just immersed it in water. Water is enough just to reduce um, the difference in the refractive indices between air and the gem. And it will allow you to see the color of the gem much more clearly. So in the picture on the left, this is me with the pavilion tilted away from uh, myself so that actually you can see the pavilion lacks color completely. And in this picture here, I'm tilting it towards myself, which then you can see that the crown is completely colorless. You can use other liquids to immerse gemstones in to really clearly see this feature. Uh, good ones would be baby oil, because they're um, really good. You'll see this very, very clearly. So let's just do a summary for Sude stones. Oh, there's another one in immersion there showing you that actually it's colourless. So uh, this is made out of a colourless crown and a colourless pavilion. And the thing that is causing colour is the glue. OK, so the different materials, they could be anything really, something crystalline, uh, something that has high luster. So it's really good at imitating um, an emerald or amethyst in this case or whatever it might be trying to imitate. The observations of this gem, we have that colorless girdle which you'll see really clearly with transmitted light. Your colorless crown and pavilion, if they're big enough you'll see it just by holding the stone up but otherwise use immersion. Uh, you'll see that junction plane at the girdle and then anything that can be in that glue, so crazed mottled glue, excess glue, the gas bubbles in the glue, all features that you've got yourself a composite stone. On to our next composite stone. We're now going to talk about corundum doublets. Uh, I actually learned these as corundum corundum doublets as that will help you remember what they're made out of because these composite stones, quite common, they've been around since about 19, well, early 1900s, but these composites are made out of a natural green sapphire crown and the pavilion is made out of synthetic corundum, but the cheapest synthetic that we have, which is the Vinoy Flame Fusion corundum. Okay, so that's what they're made out of. Now, uh, you might ask yourself, why would they do this? why would they do this because really you could just make you know as it's all made out of corundum it's going to completely test as corundum uh you know you could have just had one big synthetic it would look better and it would have been cheaper to create and less effort so why don't they just make one big piece of synthetic um corundum 
Well, the answer for why they do this is all actually within that natural layer. Why would they stick natural sapphire onto this composite? The answer is for the inclusions because the luster is the same, it would test the same. It's all about those inclusions that this gemstone offers to the whole piece. So if you were to be testing a gemstone, you might put it on the refractometer to get its refractive indices and say, oh yes, it's a corundum. And then you'll look inside and say, oh yes, I see straight hexagonal color zoning. And then you'll think that it's a piece of corundum, a natural piece of corundum. So that's why that they actually create it with these natural component on top. Uh, when we actually, uh, when, for all of these composites, sorry, for all of these composites, they always use natural green sapphire. The reason for that is because natural green sapphire is common. So in nature, it's probably the second most common color to be um, available naturally. And also it's cheap. So cheap and abundant, which is why they use natural green. Uh, the reason they use the synthetic corundum, which is flame fusion synthetic corundum is because that's also the cheapest one. Um, but you won't see the green sapphire from the face up view. It's often a very thin layer. The only thing you will see is the synthetic corundum, which could be any color that a synthetic corundum could come in. So I have seen them as you know, rubies. If uh, you have blue underneath, the whole thing will look blue. So sapphire, I've even seen color change corundum doublets. So any color that can be created by this synthetic method could be made into a corundum doublet. So let's have a look at some of their identifying features. Uh, one will be their overall appearance. So typically for most of these uh, composites, they actually have a really flat crown. Uh, this is for a number of reasons. One, because we are using a natural material that has some worth. I know I said it was cheaper, but still has some worth. So you're actually just going to go use a small amount of it on top. Also, um, Yes, if you have too much of it, you'll actually see the green of it a bit too much as well. So they like to keep that crown really shallow. So very, very shallow. They're almost flat when you run your hand across it. And then in contrast to that, do you, where you have the bulk of the stone being um, synthetic, you actually have these huge pavilions from the side. I think they kind of look like boats. They're just so chunky at the bottom. So that's often your first visual clue, not or, you know, it's not diagnostic, but it's a visual clue to say that you should look a bit closer just to check it's not a corundum doublet. Other identifying features of this stone. So we're gonna have our junction plane. Where these are glued together, you're gonna have any feature that glue might show you. So again, you're gonna have your mottled glue, any crazed dried up glue, maybe excess glue, uh, but then also your gas bubbles that can get trapped in the junction plane. These are all features that are still available on this um, corundum doublet. But then other features you'll see, you're going to see natural inclusions limited to just that very thin area of the crown only. And then underneath, you're going to have features that are typical of your synthetic Vernoy flame fusion corundum. So in this case, uh, you have your curved striations, which are completely unique for a synthetic flame fusion corundum. And you might get little gas bubbles in there too. And then of course, you've got this great contrast between the two. So these are all features we can look for in these doublets. But let's focus on each one of these in turn. So starting with our junction plane. The first thing that you'll see at the junction plane, which is on your girdle, uh, there's a couple of things. So you'll see that junction line running across, so that boundary between the crown and the pavilion. And then also you might see this green edge at the girdle. And what this green edge is, you may have guessed it, is that natural green sapphire. So just a really thin layer of it showing itself there from the side. Uh, this actually looks a little bit like when you look at the edge of a glass table and it looks a bit green, looks very reminiscent of that. So not thick enough to actually cause color, but you can see it from the side with magnification. Every so often on some corundum doublets, you won't see this so much. If we actually look just over here at the edge of the photograph, you've got this area here. And can you see that that uh, crown has been faceted to literally meet the girdle perfectly? So then you don't get a green edge on those occasions. And so that is a feature that is commonly here, but might not be there or might not be all around the stone. So make sure you look nice and hard around the whole stone. 
Other features in the junction plane, very similar uh, to the last one in regards to um, gas bubbles and mottled areas here, just caused by that glue being there. Also, uh, you might get crazing, so that drying out of the glue, which is excellently uh, pictured here, this is exactly what it looks like, just those edges which are starting to dry out. I actually think it looks a bit like sellotape, really old sellotape that you've had on a box or something for a really long time, and it looks like all dried and cracked up. Uh, that's exactly what it looks like inside this stone towards the edge because that's where it dries out first. So all of these features that might indicate or will indicate that you've got a doublet. Other features that you'll have which will help you identify the fact that it's uh, a corundum doublet are going to be those features that you see in the crown and in the pavilion respectively because these are going to contradict each other. So in your natural corundum, so right that thin layer at the top of the stone, you might have your colour zoning, but that would not be throughout the whole stone, just very limited to that top section. And you'll also might see fact, uh, fractures and feathers that just abruptly stop within uh, that crown area. So for example, this photograph here shows you a huge fracture that's in our stone, which is running in that sapphire area. And you would suspect that something that's been cracked quite so um, severely might extend into the stone a bit, but we're gonna turn this stone around and you'll see that it, the pavilion is completely inclusion free, which is quite suspicious. So that's another feature, these abruptly stopping uh, inclusions. Also in the crown, you might see anything that uh, can occur in normal, natural, I keep saying normal instead of natural, I'm sorry, natural corundum, such as crystals, feathers, silk, uh, so your rutile needles, all of these might still be present, but in the crown only. Um, and they're there to make you think it's natural. We can actually see in this photograph that you've got your gas bubbles in the junction plane again. So again, indicating that actually it's materials stuck together. In your pavilion for a corundum doublet, we're actually expecting to see synthetic flame fusion corundum features. So this is your curved striae, which is a very subtle directional feature, but it is there for some of your colours, for your red and your blue uh, synthetic flame fusion sapphire. You'll see it in there. And you might see these tiny gas bubbles as well. Uh, just to let you know, in this synthetic corundum, so flame fusion, you don't see the curved striae in yellow or colourless or even your Padparadja toned ones. So it's not always there, but otherwise you can look out for it. But one thing you will notice is the fact that that pavilion is relatively or completely inclusion free. So loop clean. So you might have these inclusions in the crown and then just nothing in the pavilion, which is curious, very suspicious. You need to investigate those stones a bit more. Also, for your corundum doublets, you can also immerse these in liquid. So I have a couple of examples here. This is a fantastic example. Look at that. Uh, this one has got a particularly large crown, so uh, you don't always see it quite so clearly. But here you can really see that green sapphire layer, which is your natural green sapphire, and then also your very large uh, ruby, synthetic ruby pavilion in this photograph. But like I said, normally it's not quite that clear. It more typically looks like this picture, uh, which showing you your much thinner crown. However, you can still see that it is showing you green coloration. And then this very large blue sapphire here. Now, uh, where these features are on the side of the stone, if they're set, you should still be able to see them if they're in a claw setting, that should be no problem. Uh, if they're bezel set, it might be a little bit harder, but you've still got your visuals that you saw from the top, so your gas bubbles, your crazed glue, and things like that. So let's just summarize what we've learned in this, um, this particular composite. So our corundum corundum doublets. So these are made from a natural green sapphire crown, synthetic Vinoy flame fusion pavilion. And to identify these, really, we've just got our six, uh, separate sections to look at. So you've got your flat crown and a very deep pavilion, and then your green edge, which is your natural sapphire, and then your gas bubbles within the junction plane. And then in the top of the stone, any natural inclusions, and then underneath in the pavilion, any of your synthetic flame fusion inclusions for corundum. So these are your identifying features. There's that green edge again as well. So yes, observations are key. When it comes to testing, just to quickly talk about that, uh, this is going to completely test as corundum. 
So uh, even for the spectrum, you're going to get a corundum spectrum. So really, you need to just observe. It's all in the observations for this stone. And now on to the last uh, composite that we're going to really focus on and have a look at in detail. And this is our garnet topped doublets, also known as GTDs. Now, these have been around. These are the oldest composite around since 1850. So uh, they are very, very common, particularly in antique jewellery. And well, I see hundreds of these. So you've always got to keep an eye out for garnet topped doublets. Now, what these are made out of is a red almondine garnet top might be almondine pyrope garnet, the mixture, that's fine. So red almondine garnet top and then a paste pavilion. So the paste that is man-made glass and similar to uh, some of your other gemstones, it's the pavilion that governs the colour. So whatever colour that paste is, that's what the whole gem will look like. The garnet at the very top is a very, very thin layer, so it will not affect the colour from the face up position. But when I say uh, in this occasion, I would like you to notice that I have said a red almondine garnet top and not crown. And you will notice that where I've done, uh, where I've drawn the junction plane is not at the girdle like on your other composites. This is a very, very random junction plane that's somewhere on the crown facets. And that's because of the way that a garnet top doublet has been made because a garnet top doublet is not glued together like our other composites. A garnet top doublet is actually fused together. And the reason for that is because this incorporates glass. And unlike any other material that we've been using, glass uh, can be molten because it's amorphous. So we melt it down, make it semi-molten, and then literally stick the garnet on top and then facet it from there. So you end up with this very, very random junction plane. So just to show you some of the features that we'll be looking for in this gemstone, so you're going to have your natural inclusions, uh, typical for garnet, in the very top of the stones. These could be needles, these could be crystals. In the majority of the stone, you're going to have inclusions that are typical for paste. So anything that can be in glass, which most often is going to be our gas bubbles and our swirls. And then we have the junction plane, which doesn't involve glue. However, where it does involve having two things stuck together, you can still have your gas bubbles that have been trapped within this plane. Also, where we are actually using two very different materials together, uh, they were actually going to have a big contrast in visual observations because we have a garnet top, which has a higher hardness and a higher luster, right next to glass, which has a lower hardness and a lower luster. So right at this junction plane, we're going to have a key observational feature, which is a contrast in luster. And this contrast in luster is going to be right on those inclined crown facets most of the time. I'll talk about that later. But it's going to be on that inclined surface. And this is often so obvious, you can actually see it with your unaided eye when you know what you're looking for. So let's have a look at some of these features. Uh, but before we do, I just want to show you what these GTDs look like in the rough or rather whilst they're being made. So pre-faceting, that's what I should say. Here they are before faceting. Um, so this is your blob of semi-molten glass here. And literally they've just gone and stuck on a thin layer of garnet. Okay, so then uh, the, uh, this whole piece will be faceted, so they'll shape it and then put on your crown facets and do the table. And it's that, uh, that polishing and grinding of the crown facets where you actually incline those surfaces, which is where that thin layer of garnet will at some point change into glass. So that's why you have this very random position for your junction plane and for that contrast in luster. It could be really close to the table if it's a very thin layer of garnet, or it could be really close to the girdle if it's a thicker layer. On occasion, I have seen this junction plane actually be on the pavilion. But let's have a look actually what this looks like, shall we? So here we go, this contrast in luster, key observation feature. Uh, you should be able to see this, like I say, with your unaided eye. All you need to do is 
turn the gemstone and uh, you know move it gently under reflected light and you should be able to see that light bounce off the surface and in those areas where the light bounces off the surface as shown here in the picture you can actually see that there is a very distinct boundary running across here that's your junction plane and on one side it looks a lot whiter and brighter that's the quality of the reflection so that's very bright lustrous here and um, bright bright lustrous bright vitreous i'm sorry bright vitreous luster here that's your garnet section and then a distinct boundary and then a much lower luster here so the same amount of light is reflecting on these facets but you've got this you know lower quality luster due to your glass and then your higher quality luster due to your garnet that's your key feature you should look for it all the time when you're observing luster anyway on your various gems here we have another example, so that junction plane running around at a complete random place somewhere on those crown facets, and you can see it's running all the way around here, that's your boundary between your garnet and your glass, so key feature. Other features that you'll see in your uh, crown or your very top of your stone where the garnet is, you'll see any of your garnety features. Garnet, garnet features, garnety, that's not a word, I'm sorry. Uh, any of your garnet features. So here I've actually shown you uh, very um, directional needles that can be seen in your almondine garnet. And uh, these very abruptly stop as soon as they reach the glass area or the edge of that boundary. So for example, here you can see you've got your needle inclusions and then there's your boundary and suddenly all the inclusions stop. So that's a very key feature. And then in your pavilion, um, oh, beg your pardon, junction plane first. In the junction plane, we can see those gas bubbles trapped within the junction plane. Again, these will all be in focus at the same time because they are trapped within one plane. And then, you know, they're not in the crown and you'll see much fewer in the pavilion. Okay. And again, these abruptly stopped when you get to that junction plane there because they're only in that layer in between the glass and the garnet. And then in the pavilion, typical features for paste. So you'll probably see gas bubbles and you'll probably see some swells in there as well. But it's that contrast and luster that is your key feature. Just to let you know, in case you are uh, learning gemology or if you are a gemologist, uh, where these pieces otherwise are faceted completely, you will not see typical paste features such as mold marks or casting flashes or concave facets or any of the other features that you see in molded glass because these have been faceted, okay? The last identifying feature for GTD, which we're going to talk about is the red rim. And the red rim can be seen when the stone is face down on a piece of white paper or on a light source. And actually you will see this rim running around that crown, the crown facets. And what that is, that's actually the almondine garnet. So you won't see it from the face up position. In fact, I've seen colorless GTDs where you still don't see the red garnet, but when you turn the stone upside down, so table down on a white background, you will see this red rim. And that again is a key feature for your GTDs. Just to let you know, if you had a GTD made of red glass, so it looks like maybe imitating a ruby, uh, you will not see the red rim because it blends in. So GTD in summary, so this is paste with a red almondine or almondine pyrope garnet top. Observations that we will have, we have this contrast and luster across the inclined crown facets. This is your key feature for spotting these stones. Also, uh, just a side note, sometimes you might see it on the pavilion. I've probably seen it on the pavilion in a couple of sets of stones. So maybe, maybe about 10 or 11 times. Uh, so they do occur and when they're on the pavilion, they're much trickier to spot. So you always have to, it's just a reminder that you always need to look completely around the stone. Uh, other things that you'll see, so any of those junction plane features, uh, so the gas bubbles in the junction plane, these are fused together, so there won't be any glue features, but the gas bubbles can still be there. And then your natural inclusions restricted to the top of the stone only, and the top of the stone will have that high luster and probably less damage. And then in contrast, the bottom of the stone where you might have gas bubbles and swells and more damage and that lower luster. 
So that is all of the main five composite gems that we're going to talk about in detail, but we're just going to talk about some other composite stones just for fun, just to show you the kind of things that are on the market uh, and available and sometimes really common. So uh, Marbe pearls, I'm going to talk about that on a separate slide. Uh, so Marbe pearls, pearls that are put together from blister pearls, made up of three materials, actually. Uh, amber, com amber composites. I mentioned amber composites earlier, when you get lots of small fragments that you might put into one piece of resin or heat up and kind of push them together. Uh, they are amber composites. Uh, diamond doublets, I will talk about in a little bit more detail. Amylite doublets, I've actually got a picture of one just here at the bottom left. So amylite is actually a fossilized shell from an ammonite. Uh, these are quite rare pieces of material, but so fragile. So we have to make them into a doublet. We have to top them with resin to be able to be used in jewelry. So that's a um, very, very common doublet. Also your lead glass filled corundum, so your ruby glass composites, uh, which is due to a very heavy treatment, which I talked about in detail last week, so I'm sure if you listened you'll know all about that. Uh, jade triplets, quite common, shell doublets and triplets, I've actually got one just here. This is a piece of mother of pearl topped with quartz, just, well, for a number of reasons. One, for effect, it looks fabulous, and two, for um, protection for shell, because shell is, again, very fragile. And also you can get cameos that are stuck together from various pieces as well. So uh, lots of different composites. I've actually got a few more photographed here. This is an azurite uh, malachite composite, something that can occur in nature, this mixture of stones, but this has been put together by man, so it's a composite gem of the two. And next to it, this is actually a pyrite composite. So lots of little pieces of pyrite put together in kind of a plastic epoxy kind of material which is curious because like pyrite's quite common. So why they would do this? Hmm. Oh, the whole thing's mind blowing, really. I, I, I'm fascinated by what they create, really. But let's talk about just a few more in detail. So let's start with Marbe pearls. So Marbe pearls, these are made out of blister pearls from the shell, uh, typically of maybe a South Sea oyster. I actually have a shell just next to me. So let's see. Oh, so when you have a shell, these are huge, aren't they? These are, this is actually a Pinctata maxima. And uh, what can, what we actually make, we make blister pearls on the inside of these shells just by slipping in a bit of a cultured bead, a half cultured bead, and then letting the naked layer grow over. And then what we do is we cut these little, um, these blister pearls out. And actually uh, these will end up being just these very, very hollow, thin layers of nacre, much less than a millimeter in width. So they're really fragile. So what we do is we will actually fill them uh, with maybe a resin or a plastic just to give them some stability on the inside. And then on the back, we actually cap it and close it up with a piece of mother of pearl, which is shown in this back picture here. So this is a composite gem, really common. And with um, when they're unset, really easy to spot because you've got that junction plane running around the edge there. When they are set, normally still easy to identify because you've got your pearl on the top. And then if it's an open back setting, you will see that it's got a mother of pearl back. And also, even if it's in a closed back setting, let's say you have a brooch that's very flat on the back, but then has this very large rotund pearl sticking out of it, you can probably bet that it's a marbe because they've got flat backs and they can very easily fit into pieces of jewellery that way. They're not going to go ahead and slice a very large South Sea pearl in half because that is just cutting in half banknotes. So uh, that's your marbe pearls, very common. Another thing is diamond doublets. Uh, diamond doublets, they can be made completely out of diamond, so a diamond top and a diamond bottom. They will completely test as diamond uh, for hardness and the way that they're faceted and their fire and even with a diamond tester. Uh, the reason that they might be created is to make two smaller pieces of diamonds make like, uh, look like one big piece. Also very common, uh, maybe a diamond top, so it still tests as diamond and wears as diamond on the top, but then you might have an inferior material on the bottom, uh, often something quite fiery like strontium titanate or rutile or something that's going to give you some fire. 
pictured, I've actually got a simulant of diamond that is still a doublet. So this is actually made out of a synthetic spinel top, which is actually offering some durability to this stone. And then a strontium titanate bottom or pavilion. Strontium titanate is a super fiery material, but very soft. You know, I think it's around a four, four to five on the most scale of hardness, so really easily damages. So this diamond doublet was created, you know, for a bit of strength, but also for the optical appearances of diamond. And how do we identify it? Well, similar to anything else that's been stuck together from the side view at the girdle, Typically, at the girdle, you see this junction plane, so that line where they're meeting together, those two materials are meeting. Also, where they're glued together, we can expect to see typical features of what glue might do. So our gas bubbles, crazing excess glue, uh, which I've got a photograph here. So here is some dried out crazed glue right at the edge of the girdle there in this particular diamond doublet. Another feature which you might see, and this you can see in uh, a few different composites actually, but I've only ever seen it in diamond doublets or simulants of diamond that are doublets. Uh, you might see the, these rings of iridescence. So if you just look in the center there, you can see the pink and then the yellow and pink and green. These are actually known as Newton rings, as in Sir Isaac Newton, he was the first one to notice this effect. And what's happening, it's actually thin film interference uh, right in between that junction layer. So the light is reflecting off of that central polished girdle area. And as it's reflecting, it's interfering with itself and causing these iridescent colours known as Newton rings. You might have actually seen these if you're into gemstones and buying gemstones like I am. You actually might see Newton rings more commonly than you might think. Look out for them. Because uh, actually when a gemstone is put into a plastic pot and the table is pushing up against that plastic at the very uh, surface of the box, you often see these iridescent rings. If you might have wondered what they were before, they're known as Newton rings. And you actually see them quite a lot due to thin film interference. A couple more just to talk through and, you know, I've got some fun ones to show you too. Uh, so lead glass filled corundum, as I mentioned last week in detail, these are created to make use of really low quality industrial corundum that cannot be faceted and put onto the market in its state that it's in. It can't be faceted, it would fall apart. So they pump it full of this very high content or high lead content glass and the result is this mixture of lead glass and corundum. So it is a composite and labs are more and more saying that this is a composite on their gemological reports because it's a very extreme treatment way beyond a treatment that's a mixture of two materials. Other doublets that I've seen out and about, these are actually, uh, the next few slides will be gemstones owned by Kate Hopley, who was my tutor. She's got a great uh, composite collection. But, uh, this is actually a Blue John doublet. So Blue John is fluorite. It's a polycrystalline version of fluorite. And it's typically very, typically, it is brittle. So very fragile. So sometimes what they might do is create doublets out of Blue John. So offering a protective layer on top. So uh, you've got your blue john as the base layer and then a protective layer of resin or plastic or maybe even quartz on top. So here's our junction plane, just showing the boundary between your blue john and your colorless cabochon. And just to prove it is a doublet, here is that junction plane showing you lots of gas bubbles all in focus at the same time because they're within one plane. Uh, here's my fun one. So this is rutilated quartz triplet, again a gemstone owned by Kate Hopley. Uh, this, well, you can see it's trying to imitate rutile in quartz. I don't know if it's doing a very good job, if you've ever seen it before. So you've kind of got uh, these painted on um, dendritic branch-like golden inclusions into this stone. Now this is actually this is actually a Sude stone. So uh, the bottom of this is completely colorless. The top of this is completely colorless. Um, is inside the glue section. Someone has been nice and artistic and painted on these dendritic brutal inclusions for us. So there we go. You know, no limit to what can actually exist in the world of composites. We just have to stretch our imagination. Uh, just to show you another one here is tourmaline in quartz. Another pseudo stone, again, not that convincing, but those branch like inclusions being painted on, trying to imitate tourmaline needles. 
So let's just go through and revisit uh, the learning outcomes to see and conclude and wrap up this session nicely. And then we'll go on to a couple of questions. So maybe think about a couple of questions you might want to ask. Uh, so the first one, discover what composites are. So they are a gem that's made up of two or more parts. This can be in many different um, constructions, so one on top of the other or a big mixture. And uh, they are artificially constructed because in nature we do get gems that or different minerals that grow together. But these ones have been put together by man and we call them composite gemstones or sometimes assembled gemstones. A uh, second learning point, look at the observation features of the most common composites. Well, the observation features, it really does depend on which composite we're talking about. Uh, sometimes when you first learn about composites, you do um, get a bit confused between, you know, which set of features is which gem. But actually, each one has a really unique set of features. There's a couple of crossovers, but generally speaking, it's really unique to um, the construction of that gem and the gemstones or the different materials making up the composite. So generally speaking, uh, there will be a junction plane. So there will be an observation of a junction plane to do, so where they join together. Uh, and then often you'll then uh, see different observations within that junction plane. So maybe those gas bubbles or maybe a contrast between the properties of the two materials either side. So then it will be those visual properties of those different component parts. So maybe they're both colorless if it's a SUDE or maybe one is more lustrous than the other if it's a GTD and things like that. So it really does depend on which composite we're talking about. And then view lots of examples of different composites. I hope I've actually really opened your minds to what's possible, uh, but don't be intimidated. Uh, you know, I remember often when I teach students about composites, and even when I first learned about composites, I saw composite gems everywhere. Uh, but don't worry, they're, they're common, but they're not Every, you know, they're not as common as you might worry about. Uh, you just always got to be a bit savvy when you're observing a gemstone, if anything ever looks a bit out of place or you have a feature that is not typical for that gemstone, it requires further observation. And remember what gemstones and composites commonly exist and look for those features and you'll be able to identify the stone, okay? But uh, you might just see them everywhere from now on, because I know I certainly did when I first learned about them. And just remember that technically anything's possible, anything can be stuck together to create a composite. Okay, now we're going to do a little mini quiz. It's just four questions. So what we're going to do is launch this test. It should come up for you there. So there should now be a test that you can have a look at. And actually, I'm going to read out these questions for you as well. So question number one. Why are opal triplets created? Tick every single answer that applies for the possible answers, uh, to make use of small slithers of opal, to enhance the play of colour of opal, and to protect the layer of opal. So just select all of those ones that apply. Question number two. Uh, we have, what is a Sude gemstone made from? So you have three options here, a colored crown and a colorless pavilion, a colorless crown and a colored pavilion, or a colorless crown, a colorless pavilion and colored glue. When I want to say that too fast, I'll get myself into a right tongue twist. All right, question number three, what are corundum doublets made from? Your options are, natural red ruby crown and a synthetic ruby pavilion, or natural green sapphire crown and synthetic corundum pavilion, or synthetic sapphire crown and natural green sapphire pavilion. So if you choose which answer you believe it to be there. And then the very last question, where would you typically see the contrast of luster or the junction playing on a GTD? Your options are on the table, across the crown facets, at the girdle, or on the pavilion facets. So choose your answer. So let's go through these together. So the first question, about half of you got this right. Why are opal triplets created? 
And uh, I was quite cheeky here because actually all of the answers are relevant and it's, you know, all of the answers are correct. So the reason that we create them, first of all, to make use of those small slithers of opal. So we're creating a new product and making use of something that otherwise would not be able to be used in jewelry. Uh, then it is also to enhance the play of color of opal, which is why we back it with black plastic or onyx. So uh, that's the second reason. And lastly, the reason we make a triplet, so protect it with that cabochon dome on top, is to protect that layer of opal, because as I showed you, that layer is so thin and actually would very easily uh, break and scratch. Okay. Uh, then, second question, what is a Sude gemstone made from? Uh, the correct answer is a colourless crown, a colourless pavilion and coloured glue. So it's the glue that makes the whole gemstone look coloured and the colourless materials, well, it could be anything that's cheap, crystalline and um, relatively inclusion free. So something lustrous and that would make a good simulant. Third question, what are corundum doublets made from? The correct answer is, which most of you got correct, almost all of you, natural green sapphire crown and a synthetic corundum pavilion. So that would be the answer. The reason that they use natural green sapphire is because it's cheap and abundant as far as natural sapphires go. And the reason they use a synthetic corundum pavilion is to make up the rest of that bulk of the stone without spending too much money. And then the last question, where would you find the junction plane contrast of luster on a GTD? So this is actually the key feature of the stone. You find it across the crown facets most commonly. OK, so it's wherever there's that incline. Could be near the table, could be near the girdle. Uh, you might sometimes see it on the pavilion facets, but that's much rarer. It's not at the girdle. OK, so there we go. So very, very good. Well done. So uh, here are some gemstone, composite gemstones that have been used in a more artistic manner. So rather than gemstones that have been created for imitation of other gemstones, uh, here are just a couple of examples which are showing you uh, them used in design and really for pieces of art. So this first one, this is by Brian Cook. This is known as the Wheel of Light. And what the central gemstone actually is, is one very large piece of quartz. Uh, so this is 825 carats. And then in the back of the stone, he's inserted these rough crystals of Pariba tourmaline, green, spessartine, garnet, and also ruby. So just these four crystals in the back, and they're reflecting round these amazing rings of color uh, due to the way that he's faceted, um, not necessarily faceted, sorry, but the angles that he's actually created that quartz in. Uh, when I very first met Brian, I was actually at the Gemme graduation, graduating from my diamond diploma, and he had one of these on, but with just Pariba tourmaline in the center. I thought it was fantastic, and he's made quite a few of these Wheel of Light pendants, and this is the one that actually got the uh, one of the Spectrum Design Awards in 2016. So extremely innovative use and technically a composite because it's made out of more than one component, but my gosh, isn't that lovely? And then here's the one from Mark Oros. So uh, this is Mark Oros from Hash New Gems, or Hash New Stones and Gems. Give him a follow on Instagram. And he's created uh, this stone here, which is a quartz, an Arkansas quartz faceted gem. And right there at the tip of that pavilion, so that coulee area, he's actually used an Australian opal. And uh, let's see it from the front. Ooh, isn't that lovely? Absolutely fantastic. So an incredible use of the angles of the facets and the design to create this amazing colored pattern. He does loads more as well. So this is from his Galaxy Gemstone collection. So do check him out. I think he's absolutely brilliant. Okay, so that's just some fun slides at the end for you. So now we'll move on to some questions if you have any questions for me. So I'm just going to have a little look at what's been asked so far, because I know there are a few people asked me some questions earlier. Okay, here we go. So bear with me just one second.
Okay, Deepa asks, oh, why is the garnet on top always irregular? Why not perfectly cut? It's all to do with how um, the construction of the gemstone, how it was fashioned from its pre-faceted state. So do you remember the slide with the blob of glass and that slither of garnet? What happens is as you then facet those inclined crown facets, just it's going to be completely irregular depending on the angle of that garnet. If the garnet's perfectly flat, uh, the exact angle that you've then faceted uh, the crown of that GTD. So it's all of those things and it ends up just typically being very irregular. So that's why it's just due to the way that it's actually put together. But great question. Thank you so much. Okay, let's have a look at some more. Uh, just, I'll just do uh, just a few and then uh, we'll see how far I get. So from Henk, a composite stone's less durable, i.e. should we be beware of the ultrasonic? The answer for that is it depends on how it's made and what it's made out of. Uh, generally speaking, be very careful. Uh, ultrasonic and steam cleaners, if it's a gemstone that's been put together with glue, do not use the ultrasonic or steam cleaner, you're going to damage the glue. Also keep it away from heat from the jeweler's torch because the glue will melt. So you just have to consider really what these gemstones are made out of. And then it uh, could depend on what the different materials are. For example, if you've got a pearl or marbled pearl, these are very sensitive materials. You treat them as you would a pearl. If you have, uh, let's say, uh, your glass GTD, this is fused together, so it doesn't have any problems with glue, but glass is really soft, so you have to be aware and treat it as you would any other piece of glass. So it's it's a bit too, um, where well, there's so many different composites, it's a bit too broad a question. Uh, but just, it's all about how they're put together, if there's glue in it, be careful. What the different components are made out of, so what are those materials, and act accordingly. And then um, lastly, do I have a lastly? No, that's about it, actually. But when in doubt, clean it with just, uh, you know, lightly soapy water and a, a soft bristle brush and everything should be really quite fine under that cleaner. Okay, so let's have a look. Oh, someone asked me what glue has been used. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. It's never something that I've come across, the composition of the glue. Also, um, you know, I'm more concerned with the gems, really. So I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that question. I am sorry. Uh, but thank you for the question. Um, and then, Denitza, uh, what is the best imitation composite stone you have seen? Oh, oh, hmm. I'll be honest, actually, it probably is the diamond composites. They actually um, get me because, you know, uh, they trick me rather because I look at it and I look at all those facet edges and they're nice and sharp and no damage like you expect to see on the diamond. And unless I'm grading it, so unless I'm looking at the girdle um, and if it's included like a diamond is, sometimes, you know, the Newton rings aren't there. Sometimes the gas bubbles are hidden under other inclusions or aren't there. So they're the ones, if anything, I think they're the ones that have fooled me the most out of the few that I've seen, especially when they're set. So that would be my answer to that. But just to tell you another really fun story, I didn't see this myself. This was actually my previous manager's story about a diamond doublet, but there was a diamond set in a ring um, and it was in a bezel setting. So you just saw the crown. And actually uh, when they took the diamond out, it was only a crown. There was no rest of the stone. And what had actually happened in this closed back setting, they had kind of etched into the back of the setting into this uh, white metal, uh, the pavilion facet. So that was quite cool. I, I always love that story. But that's it. Thank you so much. That's everything from me. Uh, so I hope that you enjoyed this session. I hope that you found the photographs interesting. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you learned maybe one or two things. But I thank you so much for joining me and take care. And I hope to see you next week.